What's good, y'all? Mikey T, the movie star, back. Report Card Radio, exclusive premiere here. We got a another piece of the indictment of OBH. Uh, today it actually is going to include uh, Hans Gadsen, a.k.a. No Breaks Bras, Free Bras, Free Moolah. Uh, today's piece includes uh, both No Breaks Bras and A.R. Ab's little brother Moolah. Before we get started, if everybody could just head over to Instagram, follow me on the gram, Mikey T underscore the movie star. Everybody who follows me right now, I'm going to send you all a follow back. And now we can get into this exclusive today. I know you all were requesting this one. All right, guys. So in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, this is the United States versus Samir Boyer, Hans Gadsen, and Dennis Harmon. I actually don't know who Dem Dennis Harmon is. Uh, this is criminal action number 18-249-6, 18 18-249-8, and 18-249-9. And this is a, mem a memorandum, uh, re the motions to suppress. Uh, signed off on August 6, 2019. The introduction. In this case involving allegations of conspiracy to traffic drugs, Three of the nine defendants, Amir Boyer, Hans Gadsen, and Dennis Harmon, collectively the defendants, have moved the court for an order suppressing evidence seized during a search of residence located at 3234 North Sydenham Street in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. For the following reasons, the motions to suppress will be denied. So right off the bat, uh, we get the denial. They're denying to get rid of anything found at the search and the, the, the seizure of this house, which I believe was A.R. Ab's house. So let's just get back into it. The facts and procedural history. A. The shooting. On September 11th, 2017, members of the Philadelphia Police Department responded to a shooting on the 2700 block on North 22nd Street in Philadelphia around 540 p.m. A male victim was transported to the hospital where he was later pronounced dead. And several inconsistent reports were made about the description of the shooter and a potential getaway vehicle. Detective Justin Falcone interviewed a security guard from an adjacent grocery store. The security guard who heard but did not see the shooting reported seeing a black male in a white t-shirt hurriedly walk to a white SUV and exit the area. After the shooting occurred... Hearing, hearing, uh, TR, something like that. I can't read the rest of it. Although he also mentioned a black male in a red t-shirt who was across the street. The security guard reported that he did not believe that man was involved with the shooting. He then gave Detective Falcon a piece of paper with a Pennsylvania license plate number written on it, which he said he obtained from a patron of the grocery store and who could connect the license plate to the white SUV in question. The patron himself was not identified or interviewed by the police, and Detective Falcon did not speak to anyone who actually saw the shooting. Although Detective Falcon had capability of listening to radio broadcasts and to call the persons manning 911 calls to obtain information regarding potential subject, uh, suspects, he did not hear any such broadcast reporting that the shooter was wearing a dark gray sweatsuit and the shooter fled in a burgundy Jeep or that the shooter fled in a blue sedan. So right off the bat, there's a whole bunch of different reports. They say it's a white vehicle. They say it's a burgundy Jeep. They say uh, the shooter fled in a blue sedan. There's several different reports. They never go and get this person who issued a license plate number for an official interview. There's no telling who that could have been who gave that note to the, the teller at the grocery store. No telling if it even really was a real person. Who knows? Why wasn't that cleared up? Why didn't the detective, detectives, why didn't the FBI go and find this witness rather than having a, uh, you know, who they had as a witness? So Officer Charles Rilera who also responded to the scene, reported interviewing an additional 10 to 15 people, but did not feel that any of them gave credible statements. 
None of the additional interviewees provided a description of the shooter or a potential getaway vehicle. Officer Rilera testified that he was aware of multiple conflicting broadcasts reporting descriptions of the shooter or shooters, including a report of a burgundy Jeep as the getaway vehicle. So, B, the house. The license plate number obtained by Detective Falcon was broadcast over the police radio and the police department citywide band. Officer Rilera received the broadcast while in his squad car and ran the reported license plate number through a Bureau of Motor Vehicles database. The license plate belonged to a white Jeep Cherokee that was registered to Abdul West at 3234 North Sydenham Street in Philadelphia. Officer Rilera then drove to that location with his partner, arriving at approximately 6.46 p.m. The white Jeep Cherokee with the reported license plate number was parked on the block and Officer Rilera stopped to investigate. A crowd of people in front of 3234 North Sydenham Street then dispersed. None of the people matched the description of the shooter. Officer Rilera determined that no one was inside or outside the Jeep that would pose a danger to the public or his fellow officers. However, he remained on the scene to search the immediate era for physical evidence that might be related to the homicide. Other officers eventually arrived to the scene. One of those officers found a set of keys on the ground that belonged to the white Jeep in question. At 7.20 p.m., Detective Falcon dr drove down the block with, sec with the security guard who gave him the license plate number. He did so allow the security guard to identify the Jeep Cherokee as the white SUV he saw leaving the scene of the shooting. All right, so it looks like they drove down with the guy who uh, was working at the grocery store. Not the person who gave him the uh, the plate number, but actually the guy who worked there. At some point, Harmon exited the home at 3234 North Sydenham Street and walked across the street. It is unclear whether any of the officers saw Harmon exit the property, though they noted him walk across the street and then return to its porch. Upon his return... The officers began to question Harmon. He told them that he lived at the residence alone and that he did not know who owned the white Jeep Cherokee registered to that address. Harmon was never handcuffed or placed under arrest, and he was eventually transported to the Philadelphia Homicide Division for further questioning. Officer Rilera and his partner remained on the scene. At some point, the police and the detectives on scene learned that the shooting victim had died and that investigation had become a homicide investigation now. So they were work. They were like looking. They were perched out, uh, checking out the property. Uh, the guy Harmon exited, went to the store, came back, and then they started questioning. After that, the victim died, and now this is not just a shooting. This is a homicide that they're investigating. It just got turned up. Uh, the warrantless entry. C. This is C. The warrantless entry. Detective Falcon and another detective arrived at 3234 North Sydenham Street at 7.50 p.m. that same evening. Detective Falcon informed the officers that the home was being held for search warrant and learned that the officers did not yet enter the home. The officers determined that they should, get, uh, that they should clear or sweep the property at that time. Officer Rilera testified that prior to entering the property, everything was under control and admitted that he did not express any concern that the shooter was in the house. Although various officers had been present outside the property in the preceding two hours, no one suggested that they secure the inside of the home before de de uh, Detective Falcon arrived. Four law enforcement officers, Detective Falcon and Sweeney and officers Rilera and Nelson, then entered the premises and exited at approximately 8 p.m. No one was discovered inside, but Detective Falcon testified that marijuana, narcotics, and items related to narcotics were in plain view as the officers secured the inside of the premises. He relayed this information to Detective Brian Peters of the Homicide Division. Officer Rilera admitted that he re-entered the home one time to secure the back door after the securing the premises. Other than that, although poll camera video shows the officers walking up to the porch and remaining out of the view for periods of time following the initial entry, it is unclear from the video or testimony that anyone re-entered the front door of the home 
after the sweep was concluded and prior to receiving a warrant. Officer Rolera testified that the purpose of clearing the property was looking for a person and a person only. He further explained that he was trying to inquire about the registered owners of the vehicle and their possible involvement in the shooting. So that's how they covered that's how they covered themselves right there. That's how they covered themselves with actually out having that warrant at this point. So D is the 2017 warrant. Detective Peters then gathered all the various pieces of information collected by the officers and other detectives and relayed it to Detective Joseph Centino, who acted as the uh, affiant for a search warrant of 3234 Northside and Ham Street. Detective Peters did not tell Detective Centino that there was a report of a burgundy vehicle fleeing the scene of the shooting or that a blue Impala had been seen leaving the scene of the shooting. This information was therefore never presented to the judge who issued the warrant. The express purpose of seeking the warrant was to search for evidence of a homicide. However, the warrant also listed that the police would be searching for items related to drug offenses. Detective Peters explained that he and Detective Centino to include those items specifically because they had been observed when the detective officers entered to clear it. So, so this is interesting because this brings me back to the one time that the police came to my house and they were looking for somebody that was at my crib and they saw weed in plain in plain view they saw marijuana in plain view at my house and i was all panicking and then the cops were like relax we're not here for that we're here for this so in this case the cops went into the detectives went into abs home abs home if this was abs this is uh, abs crib and they saw the drugs in plain view so now they're not only asking for a search warrant due to searching for a homicide, they're asking for a search warrant because they saw some drugs that they had to really, I'm not really even sure if they were supposed to be in the house at that point, to be honest with you. So the warrant issued on September 11th, 2017 at 11.50 p.m. late night warrant issue. Uh, members of the Philadelphia Police Department then executed the search warrant and seized drugs and numerous items related to drug trafficking. The 2018 warrant. Boyer was charged in a superseding indictment for conspiracy and drug offenses on October 17, 2018. Law enforcement had observed him coming and going from 3234 North Sydenham Street on October 16, 2018, and they arrived at the property to arrest Boyer on October 18, 2018. Officers announced that their presence and waited a reasonable amount of time. Then when no one came to the door, they entered the home and took Boyer into custody. Officers then conducted a protective sweep of the home and observed a black duffel bag with marijuana protruding from the top. The residence was uh, secured until a search warrant was obtained. Members of the Federal Bureau of Investigations executed the search warrant that same day. October 18, 2018, and seized drugs and numerous items related to drug trafficking. So earlier it is um, reported that Harmon argues that the video shows flashing lights, beams emitting from upper windows of the residence after police finished searching the house. Uh, Detective Peters also did not tell Detective Centennial that the Jeep Cherokee had apparently reportedly been stolen. It's a very interesting fact right there. So A.R. Ab's cat, uh, car, the car that came back in A.R. Ab's name, the white Jeep Cherokee, had been reported stolen. Another key factor in all this that makes me not understand why the motion to suppress some of this evidence wasn't admitted. Why was it denied? You got all types of, of, of benders in there. The cops weren't initially looking for the drugs. The vehicle was stolen. You got a couple of kinks in there. So October 17, 2018. Yep. Uh, so so we come to uh, the parties' contentions. The defendants contend that the police officer's warrantless entry into 3234 North Sydenham Street was done without probable cause or uh, circumstances and thus violated their Fourth Amendment rights to be protected from unreasonable searches and seizures. The U.S. Constitution amended uh, four. Defendants also argue that the eventual warrant was uh, void because it was impermissible based on observations made during the illegal entry into the house and because it was, uh, 
and because it was on an affidavit that contained inaccurate and misleading information. Defendants further argue that there was no probable cause to issue the warrant and that it was an unconstitutional general warrant because it vested the police with unbridled discretion to search the home. Defendants also contend that the search in the item seed uh, seized exceeded the scope of the warrant and that the uh, certain items seized cannot be identified as belonging to each of the defendants and must be suppressed as to each of them individually. Boyer further challenges the 2018 warrant as void because he says it was based on false and misleading statements and material omissions and because the facts supporting probable cause in the warrant suffered from staleness. Hmm. So specifically, the defendants argue that the affidavit falsely portrayed the purpose of the officer's prior warrantless entry into the house as to establish that no one was in the residence and to secure the property and that it is misleading and implied that their entry was motivated by circumstances. Defendants also contest the affidavit because it was omitted information broadcast over police radio concerning contradictory descriptions of the shooter and getaway vehicle. Interesting points right there brought up brought up by uh, you know, uh, Amir, uh, Mullah, Hans Gadsen, Arab's team. So the government argues first that Boyer and Gadsen both lacking standing to challenge the search of 3234 Northside and Hemp Street that took place on September 11, 2017, because they have not demonstrated that they, they, that they had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the home. The government concedes that there may not have been uh, circumstances to enter the home, but that the 2017 search warrant and resulting search were nevertheless supported by probable cause. It contends that facts of this case, therefore, do not call for application of the exclusionary rule. The government also argues that the defendants had failed to establish material false statements or omissions in the 2017 affidavit as required by Franks v. Delaware and Wilson v. Russo. Likewise, the government argues that the 2018 search warrant was valid and supported by probable cause and that the resulting search of Sydenham Street and arrest of Boyer was lawful. This is the discussion. A. The defendant standing to challenge the 2017 search. 1. Boyer's reasonable expectation of privacy. Initially, the court finds that Boyer has standing to challenge the 2017 sweep, as well as the eventual warrant search and seizure of the property. Boyer asserts in his motion to suppress that he was residing at the property at the time of the search and therefore enjoyed an expectation of privacy regarding the premises. However, when officers questioned Harmon outside the home on September 11, 2017, Harmon told them that he had lived at the residence alone. Boyer approached the officers while they were questioning Harmon and told them that his family previously owned the house, but did not say that he was living at the residence. He explained he was waiting to pick up a fare as a Lyft driver when the police searched his home later that evening and early the next morning. Mail was discovered and seized that was in Boyer's name. To have standing to challenge the search, a defendant must show that he had a legitimate expectation of privacy in the area searched and his, uh, and his expectation of privacy was violated. Rollins versus Kentucky, Rockets versus Illinois, visiting another person's home for a short period does not afford a defendant a reasonable expectation of that property, a privacy in that property. See the United States versus Perez. Um, up here we have the government highlights that Boyer told the police he did not live at 3234 North Sydenham Street on September 11th, 2017. Um, so here, the issue of whether Boyer stayed at the residence or owned 3234 North Sydenham Street is ambiguous. The government relies on Harmon's statements to police about living at the property alone, but also explained that they found those statements suspicious considering the fact that Abdul West's Jeep Cherokee was registered to the property. The fact that Boyer denied owning the property while the police were questioning Harmon does not definitively establish whether or not he did, in fact, own or reside or stay there. Mail was found inside the home that bore Boyer's name, and he was later deemed to be residing at the property for the purposes of the 2018 search. This evidence is sufficient to support Boyer's argument that he used the home as a residence during the 2017 search and that he had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the property at that time. Wow. 
At least they're giving him something here. Give the man something here. You found his mail in the house. Usually somebody won't be getting mail sent to a location unless they live at that location a reasonable amount during the week. All right, so we're going to get into no breaks brass here. Uh, two, Gadsden's reasonable expectation of privacy. The court finds that Gadsden does not have standing to challenge the 2017 sweep as well as the eventual warrant search and seizure of the property. Gadsden presents no evidence that he resided in the home or otherwise enjoyed a reasonable expectation of privacy in the residence on September 11th, 2017. In a memorandum submitted on October, uh, excuse me, in a memorandum submitted on August 1st, 2019, Gadsden highlights that the government alleged that he was regularly present on the block of 3200 North Sydenham Street and that he was engaged in the business of a drug trafficking organization that used the Sydenham Street residence as its stash house. According to Gadsden, these allegations liken the property, property to an office or work environment. Uh, C. O'Connor versus Ortega. Given the great variety of work environments in the public sector, the question whether an employee has a reasonable expectation of privacy must be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. It has long been settled that one has standing to object to search of his office as well of his home. But the government's allegation hardly suggests that the property was used as such. And it is well established that a connection with the property solely for drug-related activities is insufficient to uh, confer standing. Gadsden's motion to suppress will be denied for lack of standing. B. Probable cause for the 2017 warrant search and seizure. The court further finds that the 2017 warrant was supported by probable cause and that the resu uh, resulting ex execution that the warrant was lawful. 1. The effect of securing home without a warrant. Defendants argue at length that the police sweep of the property was made without circumstances and that certain information contained in the affidavit used to obtain the warrant was discovered through the unlawful search. The government concedes that under existing case law, circumstances may not have existed, but argues that the warrant was nonetheless supported by probable cause even if the court were to redact the information from the observations made during the initial sweep. Where an affidavit for a warrant is premised, Premised on information learned through an illegal entry, the court need not exclude the evidence obtained by the warrant as long as the police had an independent source to support the probable cause. C. Murray versus the United States, explaining that because tainted evidence would be admissible if in fact discovered through an independent source, it should be admissible if it inevitably would have been discovered. Indeed, even where evidence is obtained in violation of a defendant's constitutional rights, that evidence is admissible at a trial if the government can show uh, that the evidence, that the information untimely or inevitably would have been discovered by lawful means. Which means that if they would have had a search warrant to go into the house that day based on the shooting that resulted in a homicide, they would have found these drugs and the, they'd be in the same predicament as what they're saying. The court must therefore consider whether a neutral justice would have issued the warrant even if not presented with the unlawfully obtained information, and two, whether the initial entry prompted the officers to obtain the search warrant. Very interesting note up here we got. Given the court's conclusion that Gadsden does not have standing to challenge the initial entry or later search, the court's continued use of the collective term defendants applies only to Boyer and Harmon. And uh, while the court accepts the government's concession on this point for purposes of the above analysis, it appears clear that the police's initial entry into the home was based on both probable cause and circumstances. During ext extensive testimony, the court learned that the police had specific knowledge that a white US uh, that a white SUV with a specific license plate number was seen at the site of the murder, and that the same vehicle was registered to 3234 North Sydenham Street. Police observed the vehicle outside the residence very shortly after the shooting, and a witness identified the vehicle as the same as the one he saw fleeing the scene of the murder. Upon learning that the shooting victim died and that the investigation had become a murder investigation, the police 
had to have been able to clear the home of any potential threats to themselves or the surrounding community. So it is clear in this case that the police would have sought a warrant to search 3234 Northside and Hemp Street even if they had not entered the home and observed the evidence of drug activity. Testimony showed that the police were in the process of seeking a warrant before they entered the home to secure it. But the question is, would they have got the warrant? Uh, would they have got the warrant just based on that Cherokee sitting in front of the house? That's the question. The police were in the process of seeking a warrant before they entered the home to secure it. Moreover, the affidavit that was presented to the judicial magistrate contained a sufficient basis to find probable cause even without the information discovered while securing the home. Specifically, a man was observed leaving the scene of a murder in a white SUV with a specific Pennsylvania license plate number. That vehicle was registered at this address. The vehicle was observed by law enforcement outside of the property shortly after the murder with its keys discarded in the dirt, and a witness identified the vehicle as one that left the state of the murder. Such facts find a supporting probable cause that evidence related to the murder might be found inside, even without the evidence of drug activity that was discovered in the home. See the United States vs. Jones. If there is probable cause to believe that someone committed a crime, then the likelihood that that person's residence contains evidence of the crime increases. When deciding whether to issue a warrant, the task of issuing uh, is simply to make a practical, common-sense decision whether, given all the circumstances set forth in the affidavit before him, there is a fair probability that the contraband or evidence of a crime will be found in a particular place. New York vs. PJ Video, Inc., quoting Jones vs. the United States, the resulting determination of probable cause must be given great deference. Illinois vs. Gates, United States vs. Conley, uh, the court need not determine whether probable cause actually existed, but rather whether the affidavit provided a substantial basis for finding probable cause. United States v. Hodge. Based on the foregoing information connecting the murder to the property, 32, uh, 34 North Sydenham Street, there was a substantial basis for finding probable cause in the police affidavit, even if the court were to redact the additional information obtained while securing the property. The resulting warrant was thus uh, valid, and the police good faith reliance on it precludes application of this exclusionary rule in the evidence seized. Uh, United States for Leon, <clears throat> the United States versus Leon, Massachusetts versus Shepard, United States versus Williams. Indeed, it is well established that a police search and seizure conducted in a reasonable reliance on a warrant issued by a detached and neutral magistrate will not trigger the exclusionary rule. The exclusionary rule is not an individual right and applies only where it results in a, a prickable deterrence. The rule serves to deter, deliberate, reckless, or grossly negligent conduct. The court has found no evidence here to uh, such deliberate, reckless, or grossly negligent conduct in executing the 2017 search warrant. Two, misleading information and omissions in the affidavit. In addition to challenging the affidavit for containing information learned during the initial warrantless entry, defendants also challenged the affidavit for containing misleading information, omitting certain other information. Defendants contend that the police acted in bad faith because there is some evidence that officers may have re-entered the property after the house was secured, but before the warrant issued, even assuming that the officers re-entered the home, such activity does not in and or of itself constitute evidence of bad faith, States, nor does it show that the police acted in bad faith in executing the search warrant they later obtained without reliance on those uh, purported entries. Regardless, the court finds that the search warrant was ultimately valid and that the evidence of drug activity in the residence would nonetheless have been discovered lawfully, even without the reliance of the initial warrantless entry, whether the police re-entered the property has no bearing on that conclusion. A defendant has the right to challenge any omissions and truthfulness to factual statements made in an affidavit of probable cause supporting a warrant. The fruits of a search are subject to to suppression if, after hearing the defendant establish uh, the evidence of that, 
A supporting affidavit contained a false statement or omission made knowingly or with reckless disregard for the truth, and two, the false statement of remission was material to the probable cause detrimation. The United States for Yusuf, the court must hold Frank's hearing if the defendants make a substantial preliminary showing of each prong. Defendants have failed to make this substantial preliminary showing uh, required for a Frank's hearing. The first prong requires more than a mere error in the affidavit. It requires a showing of reckless disregard uh, and an accompanying offer of proof that contradicts the affidavit. Defendants specifically contest that the affidavit implied the officer's warrantless entry uh, took place immediately upon their arrival. Defendants also highlight that the affidavit omitted information about their other descriptions of the shooter or getaway vehicle that were called into 911 or were broadcasted over the police radio. First, the court notes that the affidavit does not state the law enforcement entered the property immediately upon arrival. It simply states that the police entered the home to establish no one was inside and to secure the property. There has been no evidence or testimony to conclude that the police entered the home for any reason other than the reason stated in the affidavit. Moreover, the court has already explained that even absent information related to the warrantless entry, the affidavit contains sufficient evidence to support a finding of probable cause. The affidavit statements about the warrantless entry were therefore neither forts, false nor material to the probable cause detrimation. Second, defendants have failed to show that the affidavit's omission of other descriptions about the shooter or the getaway vehicle was made with that with knowing disregard for the truth or that it was material to the probable cause de uh, determination. Although different descriptions of a getaway vehicle were broadcast over the police radio, the detectives and the officers were within their authority to focus on the white SUV after speaking with the witness present on the scene. The defendants present no credible argument for why law enforcement should have included the other vehicle's description in the affidavit, nor do they explain how their omission destroys probable cause. Even if the affidavit had included the other vehicle's description, it would have also included the description of a white SUV with a known license plate number that was observed leaving the murder scene and found outside 3234 North Sydenham Street with its keys discarded in the dirt and where it was identified by a witness to the shooting as being the same vehicle that he observed leave the scene. These facts, even alongside other vehicle descriptions broadcast over the police radio or called into 911 support, supporting a finding of probable cause. Three, the scope of the warrant and its execution. Defendants contend in their initial motions that the warrant was an unconstitutional general warrant and that the search and seizure exceeded the scope of the warrant and that certain items cannot be identified as belonging to each of the defendants, therefore must be suppressed. As to each of them individually, however, defendants have not highlighted any evidence or made specific arguments in bringing to support these contentions. Suppression will not be granted on these bases. C. Probable cause for the 2018 warrant search and seizure. The court also finds that the law enforcement search of 3234 North Sydenham Street on October 18, 2018 was lawful. Boyer argues that the federal search warrant obtained by the FBI on October 18, 2018 was void because the evidence supporting the probable cause was uh, premised solely on information obtained during the warrant search of the premise the warranted search of the premises by the Philadelphia Police Department on September 11, 2017. The affidavit submitted in support of the warrant application also explains that Boyer was arrested in pursuant to a warrant inside the home on October 18, 2018, and that a resulting protective sweep of the premise revealed a duffel bag with a green leafy substance protruding from the top. Boyer contests his portion of the affidavit, arguing that he was arrested without incident and that the sweep of the premises was really a warrantless search. Boyer thus argues that on October 18, 2018, warrant was issued based on information obtained during a legal search, false and misleading statements and omissions, and stale facts. The court has already determined that execution of the 2017 search warrant was lawful, and therefore, there was nothing improper about including information during that search in the 2018 affidavit. Nor does the 13 month time period between the 2017 search and the application for the 2018 warrant render those facts so stale as to destroy the probable cause. The lengthy affidavit detailed evidence of ongoing drug activity beginning as early as March 17th 
uh, excuse me, beginning as early as March 2017 and spanning until the morning that the 2018 warrant was issued. Uh, the judge was within her power to conclude that the information presented as a whole was not stale. This court is required to give the decision uh, of great deference, Gates. Further, the FBI had probable cause to believe that Boyer was living at 3234 North Sydenham Street at the time of the arrest, a conclusion that Boyer does not contest. The FBI agents were therefore permitted to enter the residence and conduct a productive sweep for their safety incident uh, to the arrest of Boyer. Yep. When you go and arrest somebody, you're practically allowed to do whatever you want and enter their house. So finally, Boyer again fails to make the substantial preliminary showing required for Frank's hearing. Even if the 2018 affidavit contained false uh, statements or material omissions and the court has concluded that it did not, Boyer fails to show how they would be material to the judge's probable cause determination. The warrant that was resulted was facially valid and the court sees no reason to exclude evidence that the agents obtained in their good faith execution of it. The conclusion. For the foregoing reasons, the motions to suppress evidence obtained uh, by the defendants Boyer, Gadsden, and Harmon are denied. It's really hard to read all that, man. You know, just seeing that them presenting information and they just get denied and denied once after and one time after another. It's crazy. But everybody stay tuned. Up next, I got that exclusive, the the official appeal. Dark Low had appealed the 2006 uh, theft charge. So I'm about to drop that next on y'all. This That's an exclusive. Everybody who supports the channel, you know, if you could drop a little love in the cash app, Mikey T, movie, M-I-K-E-Y-T, movie, uh, hit me on the cash app. Anything is appreciated. Everybody who follows me on Instagram, Mikey T underscore the movie star, I'm going to follow y'all back right now. I appreciate the support, y'all. Salute. <laughs>